All right. Hello, Fortinas, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is April 19th, 2024, and we're just a few days away, aren't we, from uh, real Passover? Was it uh, Sunday or Monday, I think it is, depending where you are in the world? So that is exciting. Um, some people have asked uh, about Passover. Um, I did get an email. I'll respond to that email to the sister that was asking. But uh, I don't uh, I don't officially, quote unquote, uh, celebrate Passover. I mean, we do try to observe it, you know, just to the best of this Gentile ability. You know, we do some things and we have lamb and so forth and we don't have it till, you know, it, it's thrown up for and then we don't go outside after that night uh, after eating. And, you know, there's little things we do and you know, what's a, a great way to show it? Just as a little side note as we get into this. You know, it's something I've shared in the past. Is it Colossians 2? Right here. Right? Colossians 2, verse 16. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a, hol of a holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come. But the body is of Christ. Let no man beguile you in your reward in a voluntary humility. Okay, so that's the way I've always looked at it. We don't have to observe these things. We don't even know or could even properly do these things. But we're not commanded to do these things. And so in, in willfully doing these things, there is a reward because the, the Lord appreciates it, right? Like we say, rewards have nothing to do with your salvation. Your rewards are just that. They are your rewards once you are with the Lord. And so, you know, we do it in our own, you know, quote unquote style, not obviously perfect. And I just do it with my family here. Uh, but I won't be doing a, a video or, or a teaching on it or anything like that. Uh, the next thing is there was a, a request to do a live show. And it has been a little bit since we did a live show. So hopefully the next one, um, the next video, midish next week, it'll be a live show. And I'm going to put it out there that I should finally have gone through everything for the chart that uh, our sister Tammy had so diligently put together. I'm going to finish up some of this and then we'll explain it and we can walk it through with you guys. Um, it's it's really quite the chart. And it's, you know, it, there's so much to it that that's why it's taken me longer. You know, sometimes I'm lazy. Sometimes I just feel like, ah, because there's so much, even though she has done the work, it's I still have to go through everything to make sure this is there and that's there. And this piece of scripture lines up to that portion. And it's all in relation to everything of scripture that we revealed relating to the is to come. Now, will it cover absolutely everything we revealed? No, but 80 plus percent, you know, of the main points and even some of the, the mid main points and all that. Yeah. So, so it's a lot. It's like going through all of scripture and, and putting together all the pieces that we've taught to show their portions and time in the is to come. So, I'm putting it out there that we should hopefully, if not the next teaching, then the one after that. Either the, the next one or the one after will be a live show that we'll do. I'm hoping it'll be the next one. And uh, we'll do a live show. We'll include that. We'll we'll chat on other things, world events, uh, you know, things that people want to share and ask about. And we can just have a big, uh, uh, a big share about all of those things. All right. So... With that, today we're going to have some fun. There's three things I'm expecting to get into. We might only get into two and just lightly touch on the third. <clears throat> the first one is uh, a brother of ours, Dennis. I've mentioned him a few times over the years, uh, who's down in Florida. He sends me emails regularly. He's always looking at just different number count and this and this relation to this verse and that and he, all sorts of things he sends me and it caught my attention yesterday or the day before about looking up the word for lamb and i thought huh that's an interesting thing so i set that aside and i i started looking up the word lamb 
And I was surprised by what I found because I would have thought it would have been all through the Gospels and, you know, in many, many places in the New Testament. Well, it isn't. <laughs> it's it's in a few places, but 95, 98 percent of the time where the word lamb is, is in the book of Revelation. So we're going to talk on that. We're going to show these connections and you're going to understand based on the last video, even the last two videos, but especially in the last one, in some of these connections, we were showing that this remnant worker group have these have these typologies of Jesus within them. I mean, they are the in Christ spirit filled group, the remnant portion that's remaining. So you're going to see how this ties in and why the wording is where it is and how only one of them is different. One of them is different. And do you think it would be the first one, the second one, or the third one? Well, you'll see. Even though if you've been around for a while, you could figure that one out pretty quick, right? The next thing we're going to go into is our sister. And because I don't know how to pronounce her name properly, she's Finnish. Uh, Rosella. 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 Sorry for butchering your name, sister. She asked a question uh, yesterday or the day before in the forum. And anybody who hears me when I talk about the forum, you can go to ministryrevealed.com right here. Click on that link. Go to ministryrevealed.com. Uh, and in the menu box, you'll see um, forum. You can click on there. It takes you a few seconds to sign up. And there's like 1,200 like-minded brothers and sisters around the world um, sharing and and. Bible studies and questions and world events with with all the intensity that's going on over in Israel and uh, and Iran lately. We know this is coming. This is precisely what we've been talking about for several years. We know what is coming with that, but the bride will not see it. <clears throat> all right. So <laughs> before I get too sidetracked that way, it's. It's um, in the forum, so all these types of things are being shared and discussed in there as well. It's free. It'll take you a few seconds to sign up, and we've got people there from all over the world. Well, this sister had posted in there about the about a, a, a verse and some wording found in Matthew eleven eleven, and she wondered why somebody who's mentioned there was there being mentioned in where he's going to end up being. <laughs> you'll see when we get there and at first i read it and this was last night and at first i read it and it didn't quite click i read it again and boom i it, it came to me and understood what it was and i was reading it and i started putting it together i'm like man i'm gonna have to add this into it as well because it's exactly talking again about everything we've taught on and then the third thing that we might get into i expect we will but not too, too far down the road in it. We'll touch on, on some key points, and, and I'll share a couple things in it. But I think it might be something that Ivan will do a video on. So our brother Ivan from South Africa, that he would do a deeper video on. And or maybe in the near future, him and I can do a, a show together, a live show or just do a recording, him and I together, and walk through what he's discovered and broken down and really go further into detail about it and what this is all about is the peace offering and so i don't know i didn't know a lot when it came to these different offerings when you go into leviticus you know two three four five six seven and and these different offerings and the types of bread and all of these things well the peace offering is very 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 interesting and he breaks down what the difference is. You know, what does leaven and unleaven mean? And and how did it work in ancient times? And so he breaks that down, and we'll touch a little bit on that. And then he reveals or, or speaks about it in the writing that he did about how, how, what, first of all, does leaven really mean? You know, there is a connection with sin if you have the wrong kind of leaven, but there's also good leaven. And he explains what this is from Scripture, but also how it connects to peace offering during a time when there should be no leaven from what we've understood, right? From what, from what we've always been told in Scripture. Well, there's something very fascinating about the peace offering. 
And when you see it connected to the Gospels, this is where he said he doesn't get into it, but he mentions that we know because of how the Gospels lay things out, there's deeper prophetic is to come meaning because of these differences in the Gospels. So we'll briefly get into that and touch on some of the main points and then uh, maybe a little further down the road as I study it out more and, and Ivan and I maybe have some discussions, we can uh, really get into it further and, and give a teaching on that. So, as I always do, anybody that's new, and you're going to hear some crazy things. You're going to hear things that are going to completely twist what you've ever thought you understood about the Gospels, especially when it comes to prophecy. This ministry is called Ministry Revealed. It is about the open books. It is about the revelation being revealed in the end of days. Mysteries that have been hidden, hundreds of them, that have been hidden to be revealed in the time of the end in the final generation. And that's what's happening. You're going to hear things like who the Gospels are speaking to. You're going to hear that the revelation of the end of days isn't seven years, but 14 years and a small piece called above, which represents 50 days. This has never been understood in all of this time, in all of the centuries, because you'll also come to understand the reason is because we've all been taught from the Gospel of Matthew. And so there's two ways you can do it. You can go to ministryrevealed.com. In the menu box, you can click intro. And in on that intro page, there's a list of videos there. Watch the first four videos. You can also come to the playlist and click on this playlist. And the image here, this is the first video in the playlist. It's a, This first one is a 22-minute video of teaching what's coming in the following three to give you a little bit of an overview and insight into it. The second video is a 30-minute introduction Bible study to the differences of the Synoptic Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, which the Lord told us the first will be last, the last will be first. Matthew, Mark, Luke, in the end, you will see with your own eyes from Scripture, becomes Luke, Mark, Matthew. And within it, you will come to understand why there are differences in the Synoptic Gospels, within the same stories. Things that have seemed very contradictory, what we've all been told have just been perspective. The church is what is, are the ones that told us, well, it's just perspective. You know, theologians, it's just perspective. The reality is these differences are prophecy, and they're built into the Gospels. And why are they prophecies? When they're speaking, when, when they're in different Gospels in different situations, because Luke is the pre-trib bride of Christ, Mark is the sleeping church that will go in the mid-trib great multitude rapture in the seventh year of seals. And Matthew is to the house of Judah that will be here when the Lord returns feet down on the Mount of Olives post-trib. You will come to understand that pre, mid, and post are all true. And that first 30 minute of the second video, but the 30 minute intro of the differences in the Gospels will begin to help you understand that. As you grow in the understanding and you go to watch other videos later, You'll see the, the revelation of the discourses. It will absolutely blow your mind when you see that the differences in the Luke, Mark, Matthew discourses and you see how they're laid out and what the wording changes are. It is absolutely incredible. It is unequivocally the revelation of the end of days, the Luke pre-trib, then the 40, 50 days above. Then you got the seven years of seals. Then you got the seven years of trumpets. It'll blow your mind. And that's what you're going to understand when you go to the third video. That one is also just a 30-minute intro Bible study to the revelation of the 14 years. It's, it sounds crazy at first. It sounds ridiculous. People often say, oh, no, it's already long enough at 7. Well, hey, if you're in Christ's spirit-filled, don't worry about it because you're going pre-trib, right? We're not looking to stay longer unless you're unless you're being prepared to serve the Lord. Other than that... You're, you you want to be pre-trib. You want to be in Christ, spirit-filled, diligently seeking him, loving and repentant. So it doesn't matter if it's longer, though it helps. And the reason it helps, because if it was only seven years, then it probably wouldn't be this year, and you'd be looking at seven more years to go. So you see, there's a blessing in it too, right? And then, of course, when you get to the fourth video, that's a big video. It's about two hours and 45 minutes. And that one explains how these differences in the Gospels were missed, how the, the, the revelation, the truth of the end time years were missed, 
And the answer is all because of Matthew. I don't think it was purposely done by the church. I think it was hidden by the Lord on purpose to be revealed in the final generation to a group of people that he's preparing for the time of the end. This is what's been revealing here. This is what we can show from the beginning of Genesis to the end of Revelation that the reason we all believe in seven years, the reason we all believe it's only 7,000 years since the beginning of creation, the reason uh, we, we believe that, no, I shouldn't say we, but I mean the church believes that it's everybody goes pre-trib and then it's seven years to Judah is because they have all been taught with unbeknownst to everybody. Their foundational doctrine is the gospel of Matthew. And so because they haven't understood who Mark and who Luke speak to in the Synoptic Gospels, it's been completely missed. It's completely missed. Matthew is to the house of Judah. Mark is to the house of Israel slash the Gentiles grafted in, which is called the world. And Luke is to his Gentile bride of Christ. That's why in Luke's gospel, going to the cross, Jesus is arrayed in a gorgeous robe, which means white, radiant, beautiful. In Mark, he's arrayed in purple, and in Matthew, he's arrayed in scarlet. Purple and scarlet are tribulation colors. A white, radiant, beautiful, gorgeous white robe is the bride in Luke. Pre, mid, and post are all true, and it's revealed in the gospels. So this is extremely, extremely powerful just to begin with those first four videos. Then you can keep going and delve even deeper into it. So with that, let's get going. So here's the start in relation to the word lamb. So I went and just did a word search for lamb. 105 times in 98 verses. Of course, it goes all the way back. You know, you can see it down here. Goes all the way back into Genesis 22. And the first time it shows up in the Greek, in the New Testament, is in John chapter 1, it shows up twice, in Acts 8, and in 1 Peter 1. After that, every other time it shows up is the book of Revelation. I was surprised by that. I Obviously, I had never done a word search on the word lamb before. And look at this. Out of all the places we find the word lamb in the Gospels, it's only twice in the Gospel of John. What? I would have thought it was probably a dozen times in each of the Gospels. So I was a little surprised by it. So then I go to look up the definitions for the word lamb, and this is where it starts to get exciting. You saw how here, once, twice, three, four times, outside of the book of Revelation in the New Testament. Well, when you do a word search, the word lamb, see, behold, the lamb of God. It's the word G286. Though G286 is the one used in those four throughout the, Go the Gospel of John and, the, and Acts and First Peter. It's only used four times. And it's just a simple reference to a lamb or the lamb of God. Nothing, nothing crazy, nothing over the top. But what it did is it separated it from the other word for lamb. And when I go and search the other words for lamb, which starts at Revelation 5, as you see here, it's every other word, which is the Greek 721, and they are all about the lamb, Jesus, capital L, every single spot except or two one of them is this false guy here in revelation 13 11 behold i send another beast coming up from the earth we know that this is the false prophet remember he is the false prophet and to the muslims who do the muslims call the false prophet to the muslims that's their isa right that's their jesus so when you when you study and if you look into some of the things of of the Muslims uh, apocrypha text or their their end time beliefs, we know that the Mahdi and the Isa, their prophet, like the one that's coming with them, we know that they're the Antichrist and they're the and the false prophet. They call 
what we would call the false prophet they call him jesus and they say he's going to be the real jesus well lo and behold the beast coming up out of the earth we know is the false prophet and look at what it says and he had two horns like a lamb like the 721 like jesus that's what it means so he would appear because remember what he remember what the false prophet can do he can do miracles and signs and wonders and all these things right to deceive the people to fall for the for the false uh to fall for the uh the beast this is the one from the earth whereas the beast is the one from the sea so knowing what we know if you've studied or if you've been around for a bit we know that the that the antichrist that the beast system the the antichrist that's coming is the muslim mahdi it's not it's not maybe he's going to be an arab he's going to be muslim we've shared it and we know that the false prophet is who they call jesus who they think was the original jesus we know he isn't of course and here we have in revelation even confirming to us that the muslim mahdi's sidekick prophet who we would call the false prophet is the one who is like a lamb he's the imitation here of christ just as the muslims believe pretty wild right now look every other place lamb of jesus it's all jesus 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 but look what happened when i searched that word when i searched the word for 721 all of a sudden there was one more lamb that showed up that had an s obviously this is not jesus there aren't plural jesus there's only one jesus right well of course there is but what i was telling you at the beginning if you watch the the recent videos in particular the last two but especially the last one a, a sister made a made a funny comment you know like a bunch of little jesus's quote unquote like i said and i want to be clear we are the the workers are not jesus's right they're they're a typology because why they're being given the power the authority the light their lively stones from the stone that he is and they're going to be doing the work that jesus had done when he came and so their reward is to be glorified with them and be co-heirs it's so fat it's it's hard to fathom right well wait until i show you the reason for this lambs you see just as i was saying and as we've shared many times we know this exact meaning when it comes to the gospel of john uh, sorry when it comes to romans chapter 8 those who are led by the spirit of god are the sons of god those who are led by the spirit of god that's a genesis 1 verse 2 speaking right that our, brother, that our brother Mark likes to say, one oneers. Those who are led by the Spirit of God, those are the ones who are in Christ, Spirit filled. Exactly like it says at the beginning of John, right? Those who are in Christ, not walking after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And and what is their portion? This it's it's the Spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Listen to this: the Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs are co-heirs with Christ. That's the, I say it every time I talk about this. It's, it's, it's not even something I think you can, <laughs> I don't think any of us can really fathom what that really means. You're, you're a child of God and a co-heir with Christ. Now, is this co-heir is this joint heir with christ just everybody pre-trib in a sense but in the prophetic there's a much much more specific group because it's those that what that suffer with them those that will suffer with them remember in the prophetic revelation in in the in the hidden prophecy layered within all of the texts all throughout the gospels the new testament the old testament the mysteries that the apostles uh, and the prophets had looked into that they couldn't understand, but they knew was there. What's, what's been getting revealed here for years now. 
So what's going to happen if they suffer with them? They get to be glorified together with them. Co-heirs, joint heirs, suffering with Christ, doing the Lord's work, you see? To be what? Glorified together with them. We know what that means. It's the Smyrna. It's the Luke 24. It's the, it's the John the Baptist types. It's the John the Baptist types who, who represent a portion as Moses and a portion as the Elijahs. The, this two-person group, there might be, and I've said this recently, there might be two as a Moses and Elijah in this time that's coming, in this is to come, that are the heads of what I believe will be 12,000 and 12,000. But who do we know they are? They represent Smyrna. And Smyrna is the only one that, you know, some of them will be put to death, it says, but the ones of them that overcome, they're the ones that won't be hurt by the second death. So what are they doing? They're suffering for Christ, and they're going to be what? Glorified together with them as joint heirs. So if they're going to be, some of them put to death, put into prison, some of them killed, and they won't be hurt by the second death, we know what that second death is, is it's those who are being resurrected at the end of tribulation. They're the first ones to be resurrected because they're going to live and reign, reign with Christ as priests for a thousand years. And it says, see, those who have part in the first resurrection is this group. On such, the second death has no power. So we know that they're the Smyrna group. We know they're the Luke remnant workers, the, the bride of Christ and the portion chosen to remain. We know from, again, we shared in the last video, we know from Revelation chapter 3 that when he says, I stand at the door and knock if any man hear his voice and open, I will come to him and sup with him and he with me. He only does this with Luke's group which is a part that we're going to touch on when we get into this conversation that Ivan dug into. It has connection to this. And then, so this is a not this is a prophetic picture of now. Like this is the stuff that I believe is going to begin in four months. In August, the pre-trib about August 12th, give or take. The seven-day wedding. And then he returns to knock on this door with them. That, that Luke chapter 12, 36 group. And then what does it say? Well, now when you look at the book of Revelation, you look at the seven churches in the is to come when it comes to an end and the tribulation comes to an end at the return of the Lord feet down. Now it says to him that overcome, will I grant to sit with me in my throne? Even as I also overcame and am sat down with my father in his throne. This is the kind of of over-the-top, incredible, hard-to-wrap-our-heads-around type of group that is the Smyrna remnant workers. They're going to have a meal with him after the wedding when he comes for 40 days. And then at the end of tribulation, they're the ones that are going to be resurrected to reign and to reign as priests with him in his throne while he's there with his father as well in his throne. It's always such a, a hard thing to wrap our heads around, right? And what did we show in the last video, in the last couple of videos? In Ephesians, uh, in 1 Peter 2, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, to whom coming as unto a living stone, this is Jesus, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious, ye also as lively stones. See that? So again, we're, we're going to suffer like Christ. We're going to be lively stones as Christ is the living stone. We're going to be a, a holy priesthood. This is all about the remnant workers. This is all about that group chosen, the voluntary soldiers that remain to serve the Lord as the pre-trib group is taken. We know they're going to be told in advance. We've shared this. In fact, I was talking about it with my wife last night too. It was like 12, 30, 1 o'clock in the morning. She was still up. I was going to get ready, and I she starts asking me questions. I go back and forth on it with her, and I explain this stuff to her, and I'm breaking down this part about the lambs, and she answered correctly. And so I tease her. I'm like, ah, so you do listen when I talk, and 
And of course, I know she does. She's had no choice, right? It's been happening for six and a half years. And so she understood it right away because all of this of what I'm telling you is leading to this revelation of why the lambs is used with the same word as Jesus when every word of lamb, capital L, as Jesus is the living stone, there is a plural lambs used one time in all of the Greek, but with the same word as the living stone, and there are lively stones as there are lambs. Hello. And Jesus is what? Jesus is the high priest, and this is a holy priesthood. Who is the holy priesthood? The Smyrna group. They are the Gentile priestly line that we have shown and broken down so many times over the years. And what does it say about them? Verse 9. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a purely people, um, that you show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So again, what is the darkness into his marvelous light? Just like John the Baptist, right? John chapter 1. Uh, Jesus is the light of men. And it goes into verse 5. And the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Who was the witness? John. John the Baptist. John the Baptist was a witness. He wasn't that light, but he bare witness of that light. Why? Because John was spirit-filled from the beginning john the baptist from conception had the holy ghost in him and this is going to lead us in a bit to the next part of the video you're going to want to remember that but i'll, I'll touch on it again and this again it tied into the last video it goes back to, to even genesis chapter one in genesis chapter one did i move it in genesis chapter one of course, we know it's the same story. We have what I said earlier, you know, our brother Mark calls the one oneers. It's Genesis 1-1 one, one and 1-2. One, Jesus, the beginning. God created everything through the beginning, who is Christ. And then there was the Spirit of God, right? The sons of God have the Spirit of God in them. This is the John the Baptist, the Moses Elijah group. And they bore witness of the light when Jesus was made light by the Father. Jesus was made light, and what happened? Divided the light from the darkness. So you have all this division of light from darkness, light from darkness, light from darkness. We've covered this all over the place. We see it in Luke, in John in order, in the Gospel of John. And we see how in um, uh, chapter 8, that prophetic picture of him coming for the 40 days, go and sin no more, and then he's what? The light in the darkness. Because we know that when he's coming, he's coming to the group who are like John's, who are going to be his witnesses, like Luke chapter 24. Luke 24 is the only group, as we've said before, is the only group that he says are his witnesses. And how many are there? Lo and behold, there's only two on the road to Emmaus. And it's the only group he calls his witnesses. Because those two represent the John the Baptist types, which are the Elijahs and the Moseses. Now, that's why, and I was going to say this in a previous video, this is why you see this confusion in the end of days. You see, when we listen to people, or you're listening to people who teach on seven years, and everybody's foundation is in Matthew, they understand there's two witnesses, and they confuse them with the Moses and Elijah. But the Moses and Elijah witnesses are the ones during seals. The other two witnesses, which is the other type of witnesses that are coming that we've done other teachings on, represent, the, represent Jesus as the Yeshua Joshua, the high priest and king coming, and Zerubbabel, who is going to be the other one. But that's the very end of seals to then go in and begin trumpets. And what happens is seven-year tribbers and those who can't understand the differences in the Gospels mix seeing that there are two sets of two witnesses. There, there's the one type and there's the other type. There's a group during seals which appear to be headed 
by a Moses and Elijah, but have, it would appear, 12,000 and 12,000, a small group of men, it would seem like a large group, but in the big picture of 8 billion people on earth, it's a small group that are following. His little flock, right? His, his little lambs, his little children, a, a small in size group of people. Whereas the two witnesses of trumpets is a completely different story. And we know that one very well. So it's interesting that it was something that dawned on me only about a week or so ago because we had often, and we've been teaching about it for a while, for two, three years, we, we understand this John the Baptist as the Elijah Moses type. We understand that connection in the end of days. And yet we knew there was the two witnesses of the other two in trumpets, but it just never dawned on me to realize that, hey, there's two witnesses during seals, and then there's the other two witnesses during trumpets. And what has happened is no different than all the other confusion that happens when people don't understand the differences of the Gospels and how long the years of tribulation are going to be. When you do, you see that there's two witnesses during seals, which are the ones most people think about, but they correlate them within the end-time understanding in the book of Revelation to the other two that are trumpet ones that have nothing to do with the first two. It's, it's really, really wild to see. And again, it's not that it's anything new because we've already, understand, we've already understood the works of these two. It's just never been stated in the fact of saying, well, wait a second, actually, <laughs> it's two witnesses during seals and there's two witnesses during trumpets. And the church has, has mixed them up in reading different understandings of the two witnesses. And the reason they do that is because they mix everything up because they always sandwich everything into seven years. They always sandwich it into a Matthew type of understanding. Hence the confusion. Hence, when you're looking at the Elijah type and, and, and the rain being withheld, it's not going to happen during trumpets. It happens during seals. And it's something we've been able to show over and over again. In fact, here's a little side note for you. Watch this. In 2 Baruch, this is definitely a, this is definitely a little sidetrack. So he in 2 Baruch, he's asking them about the end of days and the many tribulations. Will it be on one place on earth? Or will, it, will it be all over the earth? And it's going to be all over the earth, he says. And then he lists what these events are going to be. No particular order, right? Some will start, some will stop, some will mix with others. And it's two parts a week of seven weeks. That means two weeks of seven weeks. 14 years. Because what are the seven weeks? The seven Sabbaths. Seven Sabbaths of years, which when it's over is the Jubilee. So you've got two of the seven, which is seven years of seals, seven years of trumpets. And that's why over here, it says then it'll be a greater trial than these two trump than these two tribulations. <laughs> yeah, seals tribulation, trumpets tribulation. And when we come over here and we see the events, we see this in order. The beginning of commotions. That's probably stuff that's starting to build right now, but it'll really begin at the pre-trib escape and Israel attacked in by Iran in Haifa and Tel Aviv and them getting destroyed, right? Haifa and Tel Aviv. The slaughter of the great, right? The red horse rider and so forth. The fall of many into death. The sending of the sword. All of this during World War III, which is what? The first half of seals, like the first about two and a half years. And then look at what it says. Famine and the withholding of rain. Who is responsible for this withholding of rain? That's right. Elijah. Right? The Elijah type is the one responsible. Then you have earthquakes. This is all during seals. The sixth part isn't there. Earthquakes and terrors. Listen to this. The eighth part, a multitude of phantoms and attacks of demons. This is when the pit is opened. So why wasn't there why isn't there more explanations of things going on in the first half of trumpets? Because the Lord's here. Remember, he's returned with heavenly mount zion he's come with paradise at the end of seals and he's here during the first half and it says he's ruling in the midst of his enemies in psalms 110 right 
And then this is the second half of trumpets when it gets really, really crazy. And you're seeing the 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 pit open and everything else. So when you're seeing this famine and withholding of rain, and when you understand it's directly connected to seals, where's our chart? All right. At the at the black horse rider time frame, this famine of food and of the word, it's also that time frame of the withholding of the rain as well. <coughs> directly connected into the Elijah time that we're looking at, which is that portion during seals. So what we're seeing in this is this conversation of the John the Baptist, Elijah, Moses types. And as John was a witness to that light, so is the Smyrna group a witness to Christ who's coming after the wedding during the 50 days, he's here for 40 days, and when he comes, they will be the witnesses to him shedding his light. Okay? You're going to see how this connects to everything that's coming in the second part, and that we'll touch on a little bit in the third part. Because it's it's this bearing witness, and, and when he comes, when he comes and these people are the witnesses, that's him coming to start his 40 days, which we know is Luke chapter 24. It's the two on the road to Emmaus that are called his witnesses, and there's two of them, and it's when he sheds his light on them. We know that they're the John the Baptist types. We know what happens to the John the Baptist types who end up putting their necks on the line and take part in the resurrection of the just to rule and reign with Christ as co-heirs sitting with them in his throne. You see how it all connects? Well, that's how it's going to keep going. Watch this. So... Now, when we come to John chapter 20, watch how this plays out. In what took place in the is, okay? You could say in the is to come as well. But we know that the pre-trib in John chapter 20, the pre-trib is taken, right? He says, don't touch me because what has happened here in, in the is to come, He's talking about this when he shows up, right? He shows up. He says, don't touch me. I haven't yet ascended to my father. Go tell my brethren. This is a picture here of Christ from Luke chapter 12, verse 36, when he's going to tell his disciples to be girded about and ready when he returns from the wedding. Then you have the Mary Magdalene typology of the bride that would be taken. And then Jesus is gone. And then what happens? That's a picture. When Jesus is gone, that's a picture of the pre-trib taking place. Then he comes back on the same day in the evening. So on the same day of the pre-trib escape, Christ is coming back. But not everybody's going to know he's here. He's coming to reveal himself to his modern-day uh, apostles. He's here for the apostles. After he anoints them, he breathes on them the Holy Ghost. He's gone. And he's now gone to the wedding. When he returns from the wedding, we know he's returning on the eighth day. When he returns on the eighth day, what's he going to do? Well, the first thing he's going to do is meet with the apostles, as we see here. Okay? So if you go to John chapter 21, and you follow the storyline, we know that in the is to come, OK, that John chapter 21 represents the Lord having returned feet down. OK, I understand that. But in the is of what took place from Christ <coughs> at his death and resurrection until now. This is what followed next. And you could even see it as a type of of um, uh, um, at coming in the is to come on the eighth day because we're going from chapter 20 going into chapter 21. So, yes, of course, we know there's the was, is, and is to come. The was is from creation to Christ. The is is from Christ until the moment of the pre-trib. And the is to come is from the pre-trib 
till the end. So we're, we, you can look at this, and what I'm talking about here is both ways. That when Christ returned on the eighth day, in the is after his resurrection, he came and meet, met again with the apostles to see what they had done and, and how things were going. Before he went to go meet with the Luke group. Okay? So that is the is, and yet we know there's an is to come of this as well, and it has a relation more, th more so to the very end, the, the final 14th year, okay? And in fact, you could see it by he was naked. You know, you can connect all these things. Watch this. You want to see the naked portion. So when we talk about it prophetically in the is to come, and we've showed it like in the chapters to years see like john chapter 21 is the final year of trumpets the final 14th year in what we call chapters to years where within all of these chapters is prophetic revelation to the years in the end of days we can see just as john chapter 20 one talked about being naked we have what peter was naked there and then you have in Laodicea, this time of being naked. You see how that connects? Yet we know we are currently what? In the Laodicean age. And the Laodicean age will end at the pre-trib taking. Not, not, not moments before, but at the pre-trib taking, then the seven churches of the end of days will start. And the seven churches will play over again over the 50 days and 14 years. But for now, we're in this age. So you see how it's connected. We're seeing this naked. And there's there was Peter and he was naked. We know that as this Laodicean age comes to an end, do you know how it's going to end in our day and age? In our day and age, this is where it's going to end right here. Right here. This is when the Lord is going to come as Luke 12, 36, as we were saying earlier, and reveal himself to this watch group. I don't know how it's going to happen. He will reveal himself to these remnant watchers that are a part of the bride that are going to be chosen, that are going to be his volunteer soldiers chosen to remain and stay. This is when he reveals himself to them. And then, which means we're still in this Laodicean age now, and there's this naked connection. It will end at this when the Lord does this because as soon as he gives them this warning that he's going to return and knock and then he will come in and sit with them, he's gone. And when he leaves, the pre-trib happens. I don't know if it's within minutes, hours, but we're told that that's how it's going to play out. And that will be the end of the Laodicean age and it'll start over again in Ephesus. And when the Laodicean age, when the tribulation in the 14th year comes to an end again, it'll be again, just as you saw in John 21, where, where Paul uh, Peter was naked, you're seeing the same connection. And when it's all over, the connection is what? The workers who had put their necks on the line, who were the ones who were the, the remnant who worked with him, who, who went through tribulation, who had his power and authority that he gave to them, will then get to sit on thrones, as we saw also in, in uh, uh, um, when they become priests reigning with them during the millennial reign, just again as we just covered in 1 Peter chapter 2. So you're seeing this connection still in the is of what we're living in. So because we're in this Laodicean age still, you can look at it all the way back from, from the time of Christ and at his resurrection. And what did we see? That Peter in the, the, the part of being naked. This is the age of Laodicea that we're in again before everything plays over. Well, we've done a video. We have a video on the 153 fish that you'll remember. And it relates to the resurrection of the just. It is the resurrection of the remnant workers that it's connected to. So with this in mind, what do we know about Luke, uh, about John 21? 
we are in the is of it still right now but then when the is of it become begins we know it starts all over so watch what this says in john chapter 21 it says this is now the third time jesus showed himself unto his disciples after that he was risen from the dead he shows himself unto simon peter saying simon son of jonah do you love me and what does he say yes i love you and then jesus said to him feed my lambs and then what does he say he says it a second time and now peter he's getting a little nervous and jesus tells him feed my sheep and then he says it a third time and now peter's terrified lord you know that i love you you know everything you know that i love you so jesus says to him again feed my sheep interesting that it happens three times right but one of them is lambs and two of them are sheep can you figure out why one is lambs my wife got it right away the one that is lambs is the pre-trib obviously the ones who are lambs you see if you are in christ spirit filled you are part of that in the beginning you are part of that spirit group the sons of god and so from christ after his resurrection until the time of the end it's feeding his lambs feeding his sheep and feeding his sheep do you know what this is telling us that it's always been understood that there were three groups of people this isn't the same sheep as this sheep we've already known this and we could prove this because the first is the lambs luke's group the second group is mark's the sheep and the third group is matthew's as another sheep and you say well wait a second you're just saying sheep and sheep because it's the third oh it's going to be matthew's group no the scriptures tell us and we know that the lambs are what the lambs are the same word for jesus which means those who are what co-heirs with christ which means everybody who goes pre-trib who is with christ in christ spirit filled they are co-heirs they're going to the third heaven to where the father is where are they going to be in the third heaven they're going to be in the throne room right they're going to be where the father is they're in the inner part they're not in the outer court the outer court is a picture of paradise something we've shared on many times and in fact you're going to see where this leads the lambs are the ones who are what little lambs they're little like the sister said in the last video in a comment they're little jesus's they are in christ they are spirit filled they're going out there they're sharing the word they're speaking of christ they're lifting people up they're loving on people they are quote unquote little jesus's going and doing the lord's work so for the last two thousand years you have a feed my lambs and then you have a feed my sheep and feed my sheep which is directly correlated to the three creation portions of which john is in the first those who are spirit filled in christ lambs who are witnesses of christ even though that's more specifically to a group from the lambs who remain as little lambs as his little children <coughs> you get it lambs of the lamb little lambs as christ is the big lamb the lamb like his little children there's a group that of little children because they can't be grown-up children quite like christ but they're going to be given power and authority and the love and and the light and and lively little stones all of these things like we shared in the last one as christ is this group is going to be able to do things greater than christ did when he was here like he said remember this group in the end of days is going to have to because the end of days is going to be far worse than any time in human history so this is the pre-trib group and a group that remains 
and then you've got the Mark group, and then you've got the Matthew group. Want me to prove it to you? The lamb group is pretty easy. Okay, now you've understood. We are these lambs. Everybody pre-trib in Christ spirit filled are these little lambs, these little quote unquote Jesuses. They are in them spirit filled. They're what? If they're heirs of Christ, right? Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. Then they're related, right? They're family. Wasn't John the Baptist family? Right? They were cousins. So watch what happens now when we look at these sheep. Let me prove out to you with this word for sheep. Why was there a second group of sheep and a third group for sheep? Because it's Luke, Mark, Matthew. Watch this. Remember in Luke chapter 10? Uh, sorry, in John chapter 10, watch this. What is John 10? In the is to come, what does John 10 represent? Okay? In the chapters to years, John 10 is the third year of tribulation. And what happens in the midst of the third year, which is about two and a half years in to the 14 years? This is the time frame when Antichrist shows up. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> this is the part when he gets his power to continue 42 months, which is one, two, three, and half a year. So it's to the end of the sixth year of seals, when, of course, we see the Lord coming at the end of the sixth year of seals, and everybody's panicking and freaking out, and it's the Ezekiel 39 war. So what do we see in chapter 10? We're at the point when the Antichrist will show up, right? And Jesus is warning that he is the real shepherd. He is the one that will enter in. See, entereth not. So let me start from verse one. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door unto the sheepfold, but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. Okay, so this first group is a sheepfold. If we're in John chapter 10, which is about two and a half years into seals here, we're talking about the Mark group. The Luke remnant group are the ones being doing the work of Christ, and they're shedding the light, bringing in the great multitude rapture, preparing them in, during the time of great turmoil with the greatest revival in human history. And it's during the time of seals, the Mark group, which are who? Which are the sheep, right? Which are the sheep of this second one right here at the second time. So now we can see this time frame, but how do you know it's the time when the Antichrist is coming? Well, Jesus starts off by warning that whoever doesn't come in by the door to the sheepfold is a robber and a thief. Well, who is that robber and a thief when now it's going to be time to flee? The thief is coming. Who's the thief that's coming to kill and to destroy? The wolf. The wolf is coming to what? Scatter the sheep. Is coming to scatter the sheep. The wolf is coming to scatter the sheep. Clearly, we know this is in Christ. Right? This is the wolf who represents the Antichrist, who's about to make them flee into the mountains or into the wilderness, like you read in Mark's discourse, at the point when they're to flee into the wilderness. It's the time when he gets his 42 months to continue and the mark of the beast will come and now all of them will have to flee. Then what happens? Listen to what Jesus says in John 10, verse 16. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. Did you catch it? Other sheep, not of this fold which means this is another group of sheep than this fold. So you have other sheep and you have this fold of sheep. This fold of sheep, he's talking in the is, right? Uh, sorry, in the is to come. But in John 10, which represents that Middish Seals time frame, when the Antichrist comes, he's talking about having this fold. And that there's still another fold, another sheep group that has to come. And listen to what he says. Them also I must bring. And they shall 
hear my voice. See, this is this fold, and I have another sheep fold, and when I bring them, they will hear my voice. And then there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Listen to verse 17. Therefore, does my father love me because I lay down my life that I might take it again. Wah, wah, wah. Repetition. Do it again once more. Funny how that shows up where it needs to, right? So check this out. We, we were looking for two sheepfolds. They would be during the time of tribulation. We know that there's one that represents what? Who is this other one that will come to hear him? That's Judah. That's Judah. Right? For which during trumpets, we know he's going to do something again. Which is clearly stated that he will do it again. Repetition of time once more again anew. But who is this fold? Who is the current fold in John 10 representing Middish seals? Well, we know it's the Mark group. What do we know? <laughs> what do we know about the Mark group? How about this? This fold is represented by a mansion and court. Oh, lo and behold. What are the chances that the fold of the Luke group would relate to the mansions and court? Do you remember what happens at the great multitude rapture? <coughs> Jesus went and prepared new mansions for them. That when he comes at the end of seals, at that seventh year of seals, that he would receive them unto himself. Because he had gone to prepare new mansions for them. Do you know who these do you know what these mansions represent even now in this time that we live in in as we're living in the is and even till the end of seals the the body right the body of the believer is the temple the mansion is the is the outer court is the flesh it's something that we've taught on in the past, but I had never caught this word in relation to the two sheepfolds. And listen to this. When you go into it, here it is in John chapter 10, verse 1, verse 16, in relation to the sheepfold and this fold. You see, because he's talking in verse 1, as I mentioned, about whoever comes into the sheepfold, right, who doesn't come into the, the door, but climbs over as a robber because he's warning of the Antichrist, the beast system that's coming in the midst of the third year. He's coming in through another way, and he is the thief and the robber. He's coming to this sheepfold. What sheepfold is he coming to? This one. And this one is represented by the word, the Greek word, 833. And check it out. We've taught on this in the past. It's the same as Revelation chapter 11, verse 2 precisely something we've taught on for probably five years listen to what it says in revelation 11 1 and there was given me a reed like unto a rod and the angel stood saying rise and measure the temple of god and the altar and them that worship therein but the court you see that same word but the court which is without and for five years, maybe even longer, I've been explaining that the court here that is without is the fleshly body. It's this, it's this flesh of the, of the Mark group, the sleeping church that will come to Christ during seals, during the greatest revival for the great multitude rapture in the midst of the great chaos. This outer court, this court outside the mansion, right? Outside the, the inner part, the, the fleshly part that's without, Leave it out. It says, and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread under foot 42 months. Hello. This mansion outer court is going to be tread under for 42 months, and in John chapter 10, which I revealed to you, is the two and a half year time frame when Antichrist will get what? 
Three and a half years, 42 months, to begin to tread on what? The outer court mansion of the... of this fold. This fold, this is the outer court. Remember, it's exactly what I was talking about before. You see, the uncovered outer courtyard of the house. You see, when we know the people that go pre, mid, and post, right? The pre is everybody going into the third heaven to where the Father is in the lowest room of the third heaven. The mid-trib great multitude rapture is going to paradise. It represents this outer court. They're not going inside. That's where the first group goes. But it's part of the kingdom of God. It's just the outer court. While they're here, the outer court is this flesh. When Christ comes at the end of seals, and he's going to receive and, and rapture the great multitude in the seventh year of seals, he's going to rapture them into what? A new court, a new courtyard, a new outer mansion. Hello. Precisely as we've been as we've been explaining over the years. This is why Revelation 11 talks about these mansions. Don't me don't don't measure that court, that outer court, this mansion of flesh that you're living in, that courtyard of flesh because it's going to be tread upon by the beast and his guys for the next 42 months as Christians are being persecuted and killed. It's perfect. So what did we see? He has other sheep, and he has this fold, and this fold is revealed as a sheepfold because it's right here in the other one. So we know now, and can prove it out, as you just saw, that John chapter 21 the reason there are two sheepfolds is because this is the this sheepfold, which is the mark group during seals, and this is the other sheepfold of the house of Judah that will come to hear his voice, that shall hear his voice. We know that they're going to hear his voice when? They will come to believe on him. They will come to understand. Maybe not all of them, just like not all people on the earth are going to come to believe on Christ. Not all Jews... Right? Not all of them that say they're Jews, they're not all going to come to him. But we know many will at the end of seals. And how do we know this? Because there are many prophecies that we know Christ still hasn't fulfilled. That's one of the main reasons that the Jews haven't accepted Christ. But it was done on purpose, as we know, because they were blinded for our sakes. And they will remain blinded until their time comes. What needs to happen? Well, if you go talk to Jews that study the scriptures and don't believe on Jesus, they know that their Messiah, when he comes, will destroy all of their enemies that have scattered them and beat them down and will rebuild the third temple. The Christians have con convoluted the whole thing and all of this misunderstanding to believe the Antichrist is going to be the one to actually build the temple and then reveal himself by standing in it to claim himself God. They've smashed these things together because they don't understand. And so they think the Jews are going to fall for the Antichrist. The Jews are not going to fall for some Muslim Mahdi. They know that their, that their Messiah who we have taught and revealed is the Messiah Ben Joseph who comes as the Messiah, high priest and king at the end of seals, who is the, the Messiah uh, uh, like Joshua, Yeshua Joshua, the high priest and king, who is represented as Messiah Ben Joseph, or you could say Messiah Ben Joseph or Messiah Ben son of Ephraim, right? It's, it's all the same. The Jews are waiting for that Messiah to come who will destroy all of his enemies, which we know happens in the Ezekiel 39 war at the end of the six years of seals. And then at the beginning, at the end of the seventh year, the, Trump, the, the temple will start to get rebuilt in the beginning of trumpets by Messiah ben Joseph, Jesus, who is the overseer, but really the one who's responsible is the other witness 
who is going to be Zerubbabel. All of these things we revealed, and you could see in the book of Zechariah. So Zechariah is really going to be the one in charge over, over the rebuilding, but it'll be when Messiah ben Joseph, Jesus, is there. So how many Jews do you think are going to then come to Christ as this other sheep, as this other fold, when they come to hear his voice and then come to follow him? A lot of them, wouldn't you say? Because they were waiting for those prophecies, which won't be fulfilled until the end of seals to the start of trumpets. This is why, in our, even again in our chapters to years, when you get to Zechariah, which is like the first year of trumpets, and we go to Zechariah chapter 8, which represents again the first year of trumpets, what do we see? Not only is the house of Israel there when he says, let your hands be strong because now they're going to start rebuilding the temple. But it says, and it shall come to pass that as you were a curse among the heathen, O house of Judah and house of Israel, so will I save you and you shall be a blessing. Fear not, but let your hands be strong. Which means what? The house of Israel is there and the house of Judah. The house of Israel, which is the Gentiles grafted in, there may be a portion that's specifically Israel that, that the Lord may divvy out from the great multitude rapture, but you can see both are there. Both are there. Which means if they're both there, then Judah must have understood something to have come to him after the great multitude rapture. That's exactly right. It doesn't mean everybody in the world who is who is part of the you know as the house of israel is the world it doesn't mean everybody from the house of judah is going to come in either there will always be the stragglers and some that won't right but that is something that the jews have been taught and have been seeking for centuries that when the one comes who will rebuild the temple destroy our enemies and rebuild the temple that's our messiah and it's been so convoluted and twisted within all of our teachings over the centuries because everybody's been taught from the Gospel of Matthew. And so in a seven-year thinking, they argue with Jews, trying to tell the Jews they're going to fall for the Antichrist. And then they think the Antichrist is going to be some world leader like a, like a Macron or, or Trudeau or Biden or whoever. No, he's going to be a Muslim, unequivocally. And the Jews aren't going to fall for him. You see? Things become so much more clear when you understand the revelation of the differences of who the Gospels are speaking to and then come to understand the true timing of the end of days, all of the puzzle pieces fall right in place. It's beautiful. And so this is what we were seeing here <clears throat> in John chapter one, uh, 21. Like from the John, from the is until the moment of the pre-trib, there's a group of lambs, those in Christ spirit filled, those who are the light group and those who are the flesh group, the pre, the mid, the post. And everybody who's pre is what? Like a co-heir. They're, they're part of Christ's portion. They are the sons of God. And from them, there's the remnant workers in the is to come, which is this is the time frame of when the Lord is coming to start his 40 days, right? It represents then him going into Luke 24, and you have the two on the road to Emmaus. And the two on the road to Emmaus are the John the Baptist, Elijah Moses, right? They're the ones working. They're the ones called as witnesses. They were witnesses of the light. And that now brings us to the next portion. What our sister <coughs> had a question about. Let's go check this out in beautiful Esword. In Esword, chapter 11 of Ma Matthew. Chapter 11, verse 11. Listen to what it says. At first, like I said, I was like, what? Wait a second. Read it again, and boom, it came to me. 
It says, Verily I say unto you, Among them that are born of women, there hath not risen huh, to rise again. Who's going to be part of the resurrection? The John the Baptist types, right? The workers, the, the witnesses of the light. The Luke 24, the remnant workers, the Smyrna group. The ones who put their necks on the line. <coughs> it says, born of women, there is not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. What? You see, if you've been following this channel for any amount of time, or at least for a little while, I should say, you'll understand <clears throat> why Matthew has the kingdom of heaven. We know that the kingdom of God is where the pre-trib and the mid-trib group go. The, the, the third heaven and paradise are part of the kingdom of God. That's the Luke group and the Mark group. The Matthew group is the kingdom of heaven. What is the kingdom of heaven? It is the millennial reign. It is the promised Jews. It is their promised heaven on earth. Their, their kingdom reign, their millennial reign that's been promised to them forever. That is the post. Theirs is the city. That's why when we go to 2 Corinthians, you see it. Once you have eyes to see and you, you, you have the understanding of the end times open, you understand the prophetic nature of what Paul is saying in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I knew a man in Christ. This is that lands group of which a portion of them remain. Above 14 years ago. That's the pre-trib, 50 days, pre-trib, gone. And where do they go? They're going to be like a rapture. See, like a rapture, the word harpazo is the word rapture in Greek. They're going to the third heaven. That's part of the kingdom of God. That's the Luke pre-trib bride. And then it says, and I knew such a man. So not in Christ like the first one, but believing just not in the same way. Not that same intensity. And this one is the was caught up. And this one goes to paradise. This is the place prepared for them <clears throat> that he said he would prepare. Yeah, there are many mansions in my father's house. I go and prepare a place for you. And now you can understand the correlation that when they go, maybe there are quote-unquote mansions of housing that might be spectacular that people have said they've seen in near deaths or in visions, but we also know that it means they're new bodies. You see? Where they're going to be in paradise, which is also part of the kingdom of God. But then we see the picture of verse 14 of him saying, now the third time, I am ready to come to you. Because why? The first one was a taking. The second one was a taking. The third one is him coming to them. That's when he returns post-trib, feet down on the Mount of Olives. And now he's coming to them. And what are they going to get? Well, they're going to inhabit the city. Theirs is the city and <clears throat> their millennial reign. Their promised millennial reign. So now let's go back. And... Track out what this says. Why would John the Baptist be mentioned in these two portions of things? In one, it says, of women, John the Baptist is the greatest, right? Ever born. Notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he, is greater than John. So at first, when I read it the first time, I didn't grab it. And then the second I read it the second time, this completely made sense to me. And then I, I studied it and then I was pondering and I went and put this together. But then why is John <clears throat> least of all of the least in the kingdom of heaven? And then bang, it dawned on me. Why here is John the Baptist being mentioned as being part of the kingdom of heaven? Hello. We've covered that already, right? We've covered it numerous times. <clears throat> Why? Because John the Baptist is the spirit person who is a witness 
of the light who is Christ. He is a prophetic picture of the Elijah and Moses is right. He is a representation of the workers during seals who as Elijah, as we saw in Malachi three or four, who is to come as John the Baptist will, who will restore mother and uh, um, uh, mother and daughter, father and son, which we know happens at the end of six years of seals. And then it's not mentioned in Matthew's discourse because it only happens to the end of seals. Because the Elijah, John the Baptist, and the Moses types, they're working during seals. They receive the light of the Lord. They're the, they're the little stones, all of those things that we've covered. Right? They're, they're the priestly line, the lively stones, the royal priesthood, out of the darkness, into the light. They're the revelation too, the Smyrna groups, the ones who take part in the resurrection, just as we've shown. So why is John the Baptist going to be represented here in the kingdom of heaven? The answer is easy. When you understand that John the Baptist is a typology of the remnant workers, as we've understood now for a few years, what do we know about the remnant workers? When the thousand years, when the millennial reign begins, who are the ones that take part in the first resurrection? The Smyrna group, the John the Baptist, Elijah Moses types. Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. On such the second death has no power. But he shall be, uh, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with them a thousand years. So what? They're priests and they're ruling with them as kings. When are they ruling, guys? During the thousand years with them. They're going to rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years. And they're who? The John the Baptists. So, part one is answered. How is it that John the Baptist... Let me change his color. How is it that John the Baptist is being mentioned as being in the kingdom of heaven well, now we understand. We can prove it because he's going to be part of those in the resurrection. They're the ones who put their necks on the line and they're going to reign with Christ for a thousand years in the kingdom of heaven. Now it makes sense why John the Baptist is mentioned in that. But why would John the Baptist, why would this remnant group who is going to be resurrected to be the priestly line reigning with Christ in his throne with him, as we saw, why would they be least and everyone else in the kingdom of heaven be greater than the John the Baptists? There's a head scratcher for you, right? Wouldn't you think, you would think, I mean, really, you would think if you're part of the remnant workers, the John the Baptist types, <coughs> putting their necks on the line, being a piece of rock, being right, like living lively stones from the stone, being little lambs of the lamb, receiving the light from the light of Christ, doing all this, putting your necks on the line, doing what Christ did. And then you get, to be his co-heir, to rule and reign with him as priests, as he is the head priest. He's the high priest, and there's other priests. You see what's going on? High priests, priests. Living stone, lively stones. The greater light, witnesses of that light receiving his light. You see, we're all, this group, especially in the end of days, is going to be little images of Christ bringing in this great multitude rapture doing miracle signs and wonders in a time of great tribulation because it'll be far worse, as we said earlier, than any other time in human history. So if they're going to be reigning with Christ as priests during the thousand years, you would think there would be more authority than being called lower, the, the least than the least that's there. Do you know there's an answer to that? 
It's found in Luke 22. It's found in Luke 22. And the wording, of course, in Luke 22 is different than the ones in Mark and the ones in Matthew. And I'm not going to go into this one with Luke yet. Let me start off by going to the end in Matthew. Let's go to Matthew chapter 18 and look up the story of who's the greatest. Listen to this. Remember Matthew's is the kingdom of heaven? It's, it's the promise to the Jews, right? Here's the story in Matthew 18, 1. At the same time came disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? What are the chances that you're going to see that in Mark's gospel or in Luke's gospel? <laughs> How about zero? And then it says, <clears throat> And Jesus called a little child. Remember what I was telling you earlier? Who are the little children? Christ is what? The Son of God. And we are what? <clears throat> his children. We're like his little children, right? We are like the quote unquote, you know, I don't really like the term, but like the little Jesuses. Especially, remember, end time eyes. We're looking this prophetically. These, these little children, these little lambs these little lively stones were, were an image of the greater one and so what does he say and jesus called a little child this would be a picture of one of the end time workers unto him and set him in the midst verily i say unto you except you be converted and become as little children you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child. You see, he's not literally talking about little kids. He would be pointing to one of these, the, the remnant workers, the Smyrna workers. Whosoever, therefore, shall humble himself as this little child, the same. So who? The one who humbles himself, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Well, he's talking to Judah here. You can say even during seals, during this tribulation, he's talking here in a prophetic picture of those who are going to be part of the kingdom of heaven. If they'll be like these little kids, if they would humble themselves, then they're going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. We know these, these little children typologies are the John the Baptist. And we just saw in Matthew 11 that everybody in the kingdom of heaven, which are those who humbled themselves, will be greater than John. Which means they will be greater than the little children, which are the workers like John. And it says, and whoso shall receive one such little child in my name. You see, what's going to be walking around with a little baby? A little baby comes walking by and he picks up the little baby and he says, everybody who, who, re, who uh, receives such one little child in my name? What would a little kid in Jesus, it's not walking around in Jesus' name. It's one of the workers. Receiveth me, but whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that he have a millstone and be cast in the sea and so forth. You see, there's no other, there's no other conversation. That, that's the conversation of who's the greatest in Matthew. And he's telling them, he's talking to Judah, whoever wants to be part of the kingdom of heaven, receive one of these little children, these that believe in me. And if you'll humble yourself as one of these little guys, which is the workers, the same will be greatest in the kingdom of heaven, which means they're going to be greatest. They're going to be greater than the little children. Which is what exactly what we're seeing in in uh, Matthew 11 that John the Baptist is going to be least in the kingdom of heaven. Well, now watch this. Let's go to Mark's version. Mark chapter nine, I think. Where is it? Mark, 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 Mark. Yeah, it is chapter nine. Where did I miss it? 
33. Oh, I'm in 11. Mark chapter 9. Listen to what Mark says. Starting in verse 33. And he says, okay, he sees them uh, as they were traveling to Capernaum. He knew that they were disputing amongst themselves, you know, who should be the greatest. Listen to the wording. Again, wait until we get to Luke, and you're going to flat out see the difference. And he sat down and called the twelve and said unto them, If any man desire to be first, the same shall be last of all and servant of all. And then he talks about, you know, took a child and put him in his arms. And then he says in verse 37, Whosoever shall receive one of such children in my name receives me. And whosoever shall receive me, receiveth not me, but him that sent me. That's it. Obviously, no kingdom of heaven. No, no greater mention of being, you know, the, the greater or the least. But just whoever serves. That's it. That's the entirety of the conversation. But you have it as these little children. Well, watch this. Now we're going to go to. Luke chapter 22. And remember this. This is the connection to John the Baptist, the remnant workers representing the Luke remaining workers that are going to be resurrected to rule and reign with Christ as priests for a thousand years. All is like we say, quote unquote, little Jesuses. They're all miniatures of him doing his work who will take part in the glorify being glorified together. Just like Romans 8 said. Listen to what it says now in Luke 22, starting in verse 25. And he said unto them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors. Now listen carefully. But you shall not be so. But he that is greatest among you, let him be the younger. Let him be the new, the youngest, the fresh, the what? The young ones. Let him be the children. And he that is chief, look at that, <clears throat> who will lead, right? Who will be judge over them as he that does serve, wait on, attend. Well, what do we know about the end of days? The ones who are the John the Baptist and everybody's going to be greater than them. Jesus saying, hey, if you want to be great, you need to be as the younger, the children, you see. And if you're the chief, as you're going to be one of the ones ruling, one of the ones who are leading and judging who have rule over. Well, what are they doing in the end of days? What happens when they're in the millennial reign? They're going to be what? They're going to be the younger ones when they were working. And then in the end, what are they going to be? They're going to be the judges, the ones to lead. They're going to be ruling over, aren't they? They're going to be priests reigning with Christ. And what does it say? Well, to do that, then you're going to need to serve. You're going to need to be the attendant and wait upon people. Now listen to what he tells them. For whether is greater, he that sitteth at meat or he that serves, is not he that sitteth at meat? But I am among you as he that serves. This is a completely different conversation compared to Mark and Matthew, isn't it? He's telling this group of people much more specific things about when they're going to be leading, when they're going to be as the younger ones. And they're going to be the least. They are to act and be as the least and everybody else above them so that the greatest will be the least. Just as, lo and behold, just as Christ did, that he came to serve them and come across as being the least by serving them, washing their feet and doing those things. But was Jesus really the least? No, nope. but that's what it takes to be the greatest. To be the greatest, you got to be the least. And everybody else will be greater than you, but in your service to the Lord, whether being one of the younger children during the working time 
or even as a chief, as, as a leader having rule over in the kingdom of heaven, you're still to be the lesser. You're still to be the servant. Listen to what he says next. You are they which have continued with me in my temptations. Who are the ones being put to proof? Who are the ones going through this? Putting their necks on the line. The seals workers. The John types. Now listen to this word that only happens in Luke as well. Verse 29, Luke 22. And I appoint unto you a kingdom as my father hath appointed unto me. And you, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Do you know that the 12 tribes of Israel is the portion of the millennial reign? Remember that? Remember how all that worked? So what are we seeing? He's going to appoint unto them a kingdom as his father appointed unto him. And as I just said, do you know that that wording is only used in Luke? It's not used anywhere else. And so this brings us back again. When we come to the end of the tribulation time and the resurrection takes place for those remnant workers that put their necks on the line, the John the Baptist, who are, who are the least in, in the millennial reign. Why are they the least? Because for them to be the greatest, they have to be the least. And everybody else will be seen as the greatest. But they will be the least. Why? Because they're going to be serving during the millennial reign as kings and priests reigning with Christ during the millennial reign. And in that service being lower than the rest, they're being what? As Christ was to us. Came in being the greatest, but became a servant. Became lower than the others who were made greater. That's going to be the job during the millennial reign. Now you understand by when we get to the end of the Laodicean age, at the end of tribulation of the is to come of the seven churches, what does he say to him? To him that overcometh, will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and then sat down with my father in his throne? That's the same conversation. That's the Luke 22. You're going to receive thrones with me. At my, and you're going to dine at my table. Remember how this worked? How do we know that this group who is part of the resurrection that we know is Smyrna, that we know relates to the two witnesses, that we know is the John the Baptist, the Moses, the Elijah types. How do we know that their work, that, that Luke remnant bride portion, how do we know their portion? Well, because first of all, we know their connection to Smyrna. We know the connection from Smyrna to Luke's discourse of putting their necks on the line and some dying. We know that they get part in the first resurrection. And on such, the second part has no death. So we know as John the Baptist, they're going to be ruling and reigning as priests of God and of Christ during the millennial reign, which is the kingdom of heaven, for which he only told John's group, I mean, for which he only told Luke's group as the remnant workers that they're going to be the least. As John is being told he would be the least in the kingdom of heaven. Because in the millennial reign, the Luke group being resurrected will be the ones who will be the least as servants being high, being priests and reigning with them. They will be on thrones with them in his kingdom, being in his throne with them as he is with him, with his father in his. And yet even as kings or even as reigning as priests, they're going to be the lowest in the kingdom of heaven. Because again, they're going to be doing everything like Christ. Have you seen how how unbelievably crystal clear it gets of this remnant worker group being like Christ? Every single facet of them are going to be like Christ. They're even going to take part in the resurrection. They will get to be resurrected as Christ. 
was resurrected. And these are a bunch of Gentile workers. Isn't that wild? They're the only group outside of the Jews that were promised a millennial reign from the thousands of years ago that were promised they will be resurrected to take part in the millennial reign because it was their promise. But these remnant workers, they're like the foreigners. They're the foreigners that will be reigning there. And they're going to be doing it during the millennial reign, it says, over the 12 tribes. Because it's during the millennial reign that it's the tribes. Remember the, the three workers? This is something we've spoken about a number of times over the years that we see. We'll get back to that other one in a second. Because there are three workers, right? There's the first group, the one that's connected to Smyrna, the Luke group. And then he says, and then if I shall come at the second watch, that's the 144 at the end of seals, right? At the end of the sixth year of seals, it's the end of Mark's, dis, uh, at the end of Mark's gospel. And then the third watch is at the end of trumpet judgments, at the end of tribulation. And they're the 12 tribes, the heads and the leaders of the 12 tribes that go out during the millennial reign, but they no longer preach, they only teach. See, this is what, so what we've been talking about here has been focused on this two on the road to Emmaus representing this groups that we've been talking about over and over again. The Lord is going to break bread and eat with them. We're going to touch on this in a moment. He appears unto them. He opens up their understanding. This only happens in Luke. Then he tells them they're going to, uh, that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. They're the only ones that begin from Jerusalem. Just as we know, they're going to receive the Holy Ghost at the end of 50 days, go out from Jerusalem, and then Jerusalem will be destroyed at the Feast of Trumpets. And then he says, you are my witnesses. When we go to Mark's group, we see the second watch group. This is relating to the end of the six years of seals. The Lord's coming on heavenly Mount Zion. And we see that he's not serving them. It says, as they sat at eat to eat, and he unbraids on them for their disbelief that the Lord had been come, that was coming, in this case, prophetically, with heavenly Mount Zion, right? And then it says, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel unto every creature. So they're going to help bring in the great multitude rapture with those who work during seals. And that's why the 144 are sealed before the great multitude rapture. They're going to help bring them in. And then they're going to work during trumpet judgments. When you come to Matthew, we come to Matthew chapter 28, and we see the Great Commission completely different, where he says they're going to go into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. Uh, some doubted, and then Jesus says in verse 18, all power is given unto me in heaven and on earth. That's exactly like the seventh trumpet. Everything above, Everything in heaven and on earth is now his. And then there's no more preaching. Verse 19, go ye, into all the, uh, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I command you. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. Because it's a picture of him now being here till the end of the millennial reign. This relates to the 12 tribes that will go out during the millennial reign so what do you have you have a luke group a mark group and a matthew group that remains but there's one more group and that group is the john group the john group if you remember we were talking about earlier they're the apostles so right after the pre-trib happens and the seven churches of the end of days begins and it starts all over again and it starts with ephesus that's when jesus comes I would say it'll be secretly. He will come because he's only coming to anoint his modern day apostles. So the apostles relate to John, the, the, which, which relates to the Ephesus group. You have the, the um, Luke group, which is Smyrna, and it relates to the two witness and the John and uh, this whole group we were talking about, the John the Baptist. Then you have the end of Mark, 
which is the um, Philadelphia church. And then once tribulation is over, you have the third watch. So we've got a video called Four Watches. There's really three watches. And then the apostles kind of, you would say, stand on their own. So it's the apostles. Then you have the disciples. Then you have the 144. And then you have the 12 tribes. So let me prove to you who these are. For which the apostles and the disciples, the Luke group, they both work during the time of seals. So let me show you what this means. When we go to Luke 21, especially if you're newer to the ministry, when the thousand years is now over and New Jerusalem is coming down, we see that it's coming down as, watch this, <clears throat> it had 12 foundations. Well, when you understand that the spiritual foundation is being built during seals in people, but so is the physical foundation of the temple. It, that's all that's going to be built during seals. They will only get the temple foundation laid. The temple itself will not be laid until trumpets begins, which is after seven years. So in the midst of the seven years, the foundation will be laid. And lo and behold, the foundations that have 12 in New Jerusalem are the apostles, the ones in John that were breathed on first when the 50 days begins, right after the pre-trip. Then what happens? Once the foundations are laid, well, then you can build walls. <coughs> and Revelation 21, 17, and he measured the wall thereof 144 cubits, according to the measurement of a man, that is of an angel. Well, the wall is being built on the foundations, right? The foundations are laid first, then you build the wall. It relates to the 144,000 who will work during trumpets. And then, once the temple and the wall is built, we know what happens in the second half of trumpets. Things get repaired in the, when, at, with the Lord's return. And then what happens? Then the Matthew group. When the tribulation is over, you have, look at that, the 12 tribes that represent the 12 gates. So the 12 gates are built into the wall that was built during trumpets in the physical and spiritually built up during the time of trumpets by the 144. So seals represents foundation. Trumpets represents the wall or the walls. And what's the millennial reign? It's when the tribes go out during the millennial reign, as you saw in Matthew 28, to teach the ways of the Lord that the Lord will command them and they are gates because they're the way that people will enter into Jerusalem during the millennial reign. And so when it's all over and New Jerusalem is coming down, you have the apostles being represented as the foundation, you have the 144 being represented as the wall, and you have the 12 tribes being represented of the gates. What you don't have are the disciples. What you don't have are the disciples of the Luke group who put their necks on the line during the time of seals. Where are they? Right here. They're with the Lord the whole time. They're the ones that take part in the first resurrection. They're going to rule and reign with Christ, being the least in the kingdom, serving as the Lord did, being the greatest, but as the least. And they're going to be part of the first resurrection. And on such, the second death has no power. So wherever Christ is, these guys are going to be with them because they're going to be ruling and reigning with Christ. So what did you see? If the 12 gates are the 12 tribes and the 12 tribes are the ones out during the millennial reign to teach the ways of the Lord and the Lord is there with them until the end of the world, then that means this Luke remnant Smyrna group, <coughs> the John the Baptist types during seals, who are priests, as we've already shown and know, we saw it in Paul, in First Peter and everywhere else. We know that they're priests and they're going to reign with Christ. It said, what are they going to do? It said that they're going to, Luke 22 said it. They're going to judge who? They're going to judge the 12 tribes. 
Right? Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? That's what he ended with saying. He's going to appoint unto them a kingdom as the Father appointed unto him, just as Jesus said, and that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom. But see, listen to what happened. It said, and I appoint unto you a kingdom. So they're going to be appointed kingdoms on the earth. These remnant, Do you understand how crazy this is? Do you understand the, the mind-blowing nature of trying to process this in your mind if you become a remnant worker for the Lord? Do you understand how unfathomable this is to grasp in our fleshly human mindset even though we're seeing the words reveal themselves before us? <laughs> a co-heir with Christ being resurrected after having been with him for 40 days, put your neck on the line, brought people in for the greatest multitude rapture, being like little Jesus's little lambs to be resurrected with them in the millennial reign to reign with them as priests for which he's going to give you a kingdom as he has been appointed one by his father. And you're going to get to go and eat and drink with him at his table in his kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Why would you be the least if you're judging the 12 tribes of Israel? Because of mercy and compassion and being like Christ. Being the least and letting them be the greatest. We're the ones judging the 12 tribes. If the 12 tribes are the ones during the millennial reign, and they're the ones going out to bring people in through the gates. And this is the group who is being given a kingdom <clears throat> and judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Now do you get it? If the 12 tribes of Israel and their portion is during the millennial reign, then when do you think their portion of their kingdom is with Christ to serve as he did and to do so for a thousand years? That would make you and whoever else is a remnant worker. The John the Baptist type. Who will notwithstanding. Be the least in the kingdom of heaven. Because all the rest will be greater. Because they will be lambs. They will be little living stones. They will be as Christ was. They will be just like little Christ's. They will be, better word, I, I don't like that it just sounds, it sounds horrible to say it that way. They will be little lambs. They will be little lambs with their own kingdom in the kingdom of heaven. Serving the rest to allow them to be greater. And be the least just as Christ was when he came for us. That is wild, wild absolute craziness just just trying to just trying to comprehend that you just saw it here it's it's all revealed right before our eyes the question is who are these remnant people going to be that's the question they're going to be a group of people that are going to be what dedicated to the lord that are going to be not stuck in this old religious church system, right? This video, this David Wilkerson one that I like. You know, this this period of time, this this group of people being raised up that will be empowered like none other before it. That 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 are going to be outside of the the religious system because it is so twisted and it's so corrupted. It is it is missed the understanding because everybody just says, oh, yes, oh, yes. And nobody goes and spends time themselves to seek it out in the word. You see people say that all the time. Go look at other YouTube channels and look at the comments. People say crazy, crazy things. And you've got dozens and dozens of people saying, wow, that was awesome. Wow, that was awesome. Do you think they actually went and followed the scriptures? Or were they just listening to people talk and they'd explain one verse here and one verse and that's their whole sermon? We have to be diligent in the Lord. The, the church is, is a corrupted church right now. It doesn't mean entirely, 
But in general, the church is, is, is lost. They're asleep. Do you understand? We are in the Laodicean age. So while the world tries to convince you and tell you, oh, the greatest revival is beginning, it's happening now. It can't. There is no such thing as a greatest revival in human history happening during the Laodicean age of the lukewarm falling away. It's not possible. It's not possible. It has to be brought back to the beginning of a new church age when the old will die away. When, when the, when the pre-trib happens and all of those who are ready and diligent and seeking the Lord are taken away, then he can bring about a cleansing of the church and use his remnant little lambs to wake up the world. That's the power. That's the authority. That's the stuff that Wilkerson was talking about here. I love this video so much. I'm not going to go through it over and over again. But it's absolutely fantastic. And you know what? I think there was enough good stuff here today that uh, I don't, I'm not going to go into all this stuff with Ivan's yet. Um, I would rather not just touch on it. Um, I would rather go through it more diligently. And I'll see if maybe Ivan and I, as we kind of go through it more together, um, maybe we can do something together with it. Uh, or if Ivan does a great teaching on it, maybe... Uh, I can direct you guys there, but we'll talk about it more. But I will say a little bit on this. Um, you know, there, there's this mystery that you're going to come to understand within, <clears throat> within the story of what's called the peace offering. You're going to find out that there is leavened bread, which is offered as a peace offering offering and this leavened bread that is offered as a peace offering guess what it can happen during unleavened bread now am i saying for those of you who are saying oh we're looking for passover and unleavened bread and that's no 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 that's not what i'm saying that's not what i'm saying okay this leavened bread was instead given to priests priests how about that it's given to priests and it's a peace offering remember what we've taught in the luke mark matthew story the resurrection story even though it happens at passover unleavened bread time is a prophetic picture in luke mark and matthew of pre-trib mid-trib and post-trib it doesn't mean that the pre-trib happens at unleavened bread and the mid-trib happens at unleavened bread and the post-trib happens at unleavened bread that is not what's going on it is the typologies the symbology the wording built within it that reveals the pre mid and post comings of the lord after the pre-trib it's the 40 days when he starts his 40 days it's when he comes at the end of the sixth year of seals. It's, it's a picture of when he comes at the end of the sixth year of trumpets. It's not actually at unleavened bread. Okay? We've done the same thing. We've shown it with the triumphal entry. With the triumphal entry, you could see a pre, mid, and post of the triumphal entry comings of the Lord. It doesn't mean it's going to happen at the triumphal entry time frame that it did in history. The other thing we see, I mean, we've got a video, right? The uh, uh, the resurrection, the triumphal entry, and the other one is the um, Mount of Transfiguration. We see the typologies of the comings of the Lord pre-mid-post in the triumphal entries of all three, but it doesn't mean it's going to happen at the triumphal entry in all three. They are simply typologies of events and things being worded and given to us to understand pictures and events of his pre mid and post that's going to take place in the times that will actually happen at and so when we go into this and you go into luke 
you go into the story of course of luke mark and matthew and you go into the institution of the last supper what do we know happens only in luke compared to mark and matthew well in luke's last supper in 22 verse 15 it said and he said unto them with desire i have desired to eat this passover with you before i suffer for i say unto you i will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of god only luke's group does he eat the meal with them listen to the difference we see this even in the resurrection remember here he is with the disciples the last supper as they did eat okay as they did eat when we go to matthew <clears throat> matthew 26 we see in matthew 26 <coughs> and as they were eating you see only luke's do you ever see that jesus is eating with them just like it's it's relating not to the pre-trib it's relating to the remnant workers that he when he comes for the 40 days after the wedding the the pre-trib is is not related directly to christ in that sense these the pre mid post of his comings the pre is him coming for 40 days the mid is him coming at the end of the sixth year of seals to start the seventh year that's not the great multitude rapture neither at, at mid trib neither is the pre trib of him coming for 40 days neither is that the pre trib and in matthew <clears throat> only in matthew is the post trib him actually coming feet down and that's because at that point he'll be seen by the whole world as lightning from one end to the other so when he comes for the luke group which we see that he only eats with the luke group for the last supper in relation to this we know this in the resurrection as well and as you dig into these things which will happen in a later story in a later teaching as as ivan has broken a lot of this down you're gonna you're gonna come to understand about this peace offering and the peace offering is is a offering of leavened bread and guess what it can happen during the week of unleavened bread what that's right and the peace offering is something that they take part in eating even though it's unleavened bread but do you know out of all of the offerings in relation to food it's the only one that they could eat the peace offering was the only sacrifice worshipers could eat the peace offering was the only sacrifice worshipers could eat hello watch this here's the resurrection story okay now in the is okay in the is of the story this is supposed to be the resurrection we're told that it was the third day you know when they're talking with them uh oh didn't you know and he says and today is the third day okay so in the is of the event of what happened this would be unleavened bread wouldn't it this would be the time of unleavened bread and we've all been told that you can't have anything i mean the scripture says the week of unleavened bread get rid of leaven you can't have leaven except for a peace offering except for a peace offering and what happens check this out in luke 24 30 it says and it came to pass as he sat at meat with them again here he is sitting to eat with them 
when you go to the resurrection story again, in not only the, the Passover meal, but when you go to the resurrection story of Luke, Mark, and Matthew, he only has the meal with Luke, as you guys know. And what does it say? And as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to them. Watch this. Look at that. He sat to eat with them, right? This word for sitting to eat, you guys will probably remember it, is to recline down, to take place at a table, to make, to sit down at eat. It's only used three times. Check it out. Luke. Do you remember the story of Luke? It's only to be used three times. Listen to what happens. In Luke 9.14. Remember, this, this 9.14 period is the picture of the pre-trib. When we get to 9.28, it says, about an eight days after these sayings, because the eighth day is a prophetic picture of the eighth year is close to starting, right? It's in the above 50 days before the eighth year, which is then the first year of the next seven, which is the beginning of Trump, of tribulation. This is right when the, the pre-trib and the wedding's going to take place. And we see only in Luke that they're made to sit down by companies of 50. This companies of 50, as we've revealed, is this group that gets to recline and to sit down at a meal. And then what happens? Luke 14, 8. You guys know this very well, don't you? We've covered it so many times. We know this is the relation to the wedding. And in Luke 14, it is the Gentile wedding. When thou art bidden of any man to a wedding, sit not down in the highest room, lest a more honorable man. I just mentioned it earlier. And then what does it say? Then you've got the one from Luke 24, 30. And it came to pass as he sat down at meat with them. So what are we seeing? We're seeing that in the in the pre-trib picture typology of what's going on in Luke 9, we see it's related to the wedding feast when this group is going to be bidden to go to the pre-trib Gentile wedding, which is the Luke wedding feast. Remember, there's no wedding feast mentioned in Mark. And in Matthew, it's the Jewish one at the end of tribulation. This is the pre-trib Gentile one. And what do we know about them? We know this is the pre-trib group, the ones being taken. And then only Luke's has the great banquet. And Luke's great banquet is for the meal that he's going to have with what? With those who will take part of the resurrection of the just. So when he comes back from the wedding, as we've explained many times, when he comes back from the wedding, which is taking place here, and he's coming then, which is the same as the Luke 9, when they sit down and sit in these ways. He's coming back on the eighth day. And when he comes back on the eighth day, which is in Luke chapter 9, verse 28, what does it say? There he is with Moses and Elijah. Who are they represented as? The John the Baptist. What do we know they're going to have? They're going to sit down and have a meal with the Lord, as I just showed to you, when he returns from the wedding and knocks. And when he returns from the wedding and knocks, who's the, who are the ones that take part in it? The ones who will be part of the resurrection of the just. And the ones who are part of the resurrection of the just are the Luke 24 ones who we see when he's coming with them and is going to sit down and have a meal with them and they get to what? Recline with them at the table. Hello! Now check this out. When he sits down to have this meal with them, <coughs> remember, the one who brings the offering, if it's a peace offering, if it's a peace offering that comes in, this peace offering that comes in, Listen to what it says. This is uh, Leviticus 7. We'll just touch on a little bit. And the flesh of the sacrifice of the peace offering for thanksgiving shall be eaten. In verse 16, but if the sacrifice of this offering be a vow or a voluntary offering, it shall be eaten. Now, hold on a second. 
Let's go look at that real quick. A voluntary offering. Where did we see a voluntary offering? Well, lo and behold, it's the free will offering, isn't it, right? <coughs> it's this, it's the warriors, it's the soldiers, it's the volunteers who will say, yes, Lord, I will serve you. And what is he doing? In, in Luke 24, he's having a meal where he is breaking bread with them in this voluntary offering, which we know from Deuteronomy 16, in this voluntary offering, this tribute of a free will offering, hello, this tribute, of a free will offering of thine hand connected to the Feast of Weeks. And we know that the pre-trib group goes at the Feast of Weeks and he told this pre-trib group in Luke chapter 12, right before he takes them, to be ready when I return from the wedding that when I come and knock, I may open unto you immediately because what do we know? It's the end of Laodicean age and they're going to open unto him immediately and he's going to come and serve them and he's going to sit down and come and eat with them. We know that they are the Luke 24 group and when he comes and does this, he's doing it in the reclining fashion for those that will take part in the resurrection because they are serving him as little lambs and when he breaks this bread, it's the peace offering bread that he's breaking. Listen to this word for bread. The word for bread is 740. Bread as raised or loaf. Bread as raised or loaf. Wait a second. I thought this in the is was his resurrection at unleavened bread. This is the week of unleavened bread and what took place in the is of it. Yet, he's serving them in a reclined state, just this group, which he doesn't do with the Mark or the Matthew group. And when he serves them bread and he eats with them, he's taking part in the raised loaf, the leavened bread, in what? A peace offering. He's eating it with them, which is what happens with the peace offering. It's to be eaten by the one who offers it. And it's also given to? You guessed it. You guessed it. If you said priests, then you're correct. And who are the priests who take part in the resurrection? The same Luke 24 group. The only ones he has that meal with in the reclined state when he returns from the wedding. He's having a peace offering with them, brothers and sisters. And when he has this peace offering with them, it's a vow or a voluntary offering by the priests who have accepted to serve him as his soldiers, as his little lambs, as his uh, lively stones as lights being witnesses of the light to help serve him to be like him to bring in his lost sheep of the house of israel for which when he then shows up on heavenly mount zion those of the other sheep of the other fold will recognize him by the prophetic fulfillment of those things that he will then do, that's why at that point, those sheep, that other fold, will hear him. And it will have been the lambs, brothers and sisters. It will have been the lambs who brought in and woke up the sheep with the help, of course, of apostles as well. Well, brothers and sisters, there's a lot more. We could have gone down a, a real deep path, but it's it's a lot to go into. And I just 
I felt there was enough great excitement with the first two portions to give you a little taste of that third one, to be able to see and to understand this, this group, this remnant group that's going to be chosen. If, if you just go watch this Wilkerson video again, it really, truly is as powerful as he claimed it would, it was going to be back decades ago when he made that recording. There is a remnant being prepared. They are diligent. They are loving. They are seeking the Lord. They are repentant. They are being strengthened. They're joy-filled in seeking the Lord. They are this first Peter, chapter 1, that we've shared on many times. It's so exciting to hear. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fades not away, reserved for you in heaven, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the end of days, wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness. Hello? It's like me saying, uh, can I get an amen? Even though now for a season we are in heaviness through many fold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing. This is when he comes to appear to them. Pre-trib. That unto the appearing of Christ Jesus, whom having not seen you love right now, in whom though you see him not, yet believing you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. As we've shown, guys, there's only one way to be alive and receive the end of your faith. And that is for those who will be his remnant workers, those ready to be revealed in the time of the end, at the appearing of Christ for his 40 days, who even though now we don't see him, love him, who even though now not seeing him, we believe, we rejoice, we are in joy unspeakable, filled. At that point, we will receive the end of our faith and the salvation of our souls, Jesus Christ, in our midst. Who will what? Have a meal with us and serve us who are the voluntary, the voluntary remnant when he will recline with us at the banquet meal. Brothers and sisters, I pray this blesses you. I pray it gives you strength. I pray it encourages you, draws you closer, gets you seeking and searching even deeper. Brothers and sisters, I love you. God bless you. Don't forget, if you want to support the ministry as well, we have links here as well as in the description box under the videos. It's always greatly appreciated. There are many people that we can help and do help. We just need the support. So with that, God bless you all. God bless your families. Talk to you soon. Bye for now.